Well, good morning. Thank you so much for joining the live stream of Living Grace Evangelical Church. Uh, wherever you are and whatever time you're watching this, whether it's right now with us on Sunday mornings or whether it's later on during the week or at another time, we're just so happy that you've joined us this morning for worship. Where will you run, my soul? Where will you go when wells run dry? starts to blow how you gonna keep this flame alive in the fading light when night is breaking i know you will always be waiting you'll always be there i'm running to the secret place where you are where you are of all the ways you stole my heart, stole my heart. Better is a moment that I spend with you than a million other days away. I'm running, I'm running, I'm running to the secret place. Turn to heaven and speak. 
spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory. cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living
so we've been digging into the book of Genesis. We've been talking about how Genesis really, you know, gives us these theological foundations and, and it lays out lessons for us and that really have application and implication for our everyday life. And so we've been looking at the book of Genesis and, and today we're going to continue in that. We're going to be looking at a topic that it's pretty relevant speaking to, you know, in this passage, really speaking to multiple different topics, but it's one of those key passages that lays some theological framework uh, for a lot of different things that we believe as Christians, a lot of different biblical stances on things uh, that are really relevant to our culture today. And, you know, uh, much like anything in life, it's important to know the why behind the what we believe. Uh, it's important to know the the whys behind the what's we believe. And today, that's what we're going to be digging into, really, the why behind the what we believe concerning the biblical stance on marriage. And, and it's important for us to know those whys because it helps us to explain the what's, the why we believe these things, helps us to, to explain our stances on things uh, such as uh, you know, gender or such as marriage, such as uh, you know, uh, uh, human sexuality. And so it's important for us to know the whys behind the what's we believe. And so today we're going to be looking at one of those key passages, Genesis 2, verses 18 through 25, which is a section of scripture that's really going to lay that, I, I think, it, it speaks to three crucial areas and cr three crucial areas that helps us to understand the why behind the what we believe uh, concerning marriage. And so that first kind of crucial area that it, it, this passage addresses, uh, it addresses identity. It addresses identity. And again, we're, we're talking through the lens of marriage, but again, it, there's a lot of different applications and implications for other things other than just marriage. So we'll kind of get there when we get there. But uh, we're going to look at here in Genesis chapter 2, just starting here in verse 18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So in these first few chapters, we've seen, you know, some pretty crucial things, I think, concerning identity, right? Uh, concerning human identity. Uh, when we go to Genesis chapter 1, even looking at verses 26 and 27, it talks about how humanity, human beings are created in the image of God, right? And, and in verse 27, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And so we understand that part of what that means, part of this idea of being created in the image of God is that as God's representatives here on earth, we, we, we are in a position of dominion, a position of rule. In fact, you know, he gives us the command, he gives humanity the command in chapter one uh, to have dominion over the animals, over the earth. And so the reality is, is we see that that's part of this idea of what it means to be in, made in the image of God. You know, in the ancient Near East, uh, you know, uh, it, there was this idea of naming something, showing that you had rule or authority or, or dominion over those things. And we see that played out here in chapter two, where God brings the animals later in this chapter, God brings the animals to Adam and has him name the animals and whatever Adam named the animals, that's what they were called. And so again, it's kind of this extension of what it means to be made in the image of God, having rule and dominion. But again, in chapter one, verse 26 and in verse 27, another crucial aspect that is spoken to here about identity, identity of human beings is that God created humanity, his design for humanity is two genders, male and female. Now, God's, you know, his intent and his design, it's not meant to be, it's not, it's meant to be one that is, is freeing and fulfilling uh, in accordance to his commands, where in, in his commands in chapter one is to be fruitful and to multiply. And so the reality is, is that God's intent, it's meant to be one that's freeing and fulfilling. And so we see that these different pieces of identity that we've already explored, we've already looked at, and that kind of come to fruition here when we're talking about human identity. Uh, but another thing that we see here that's pertaining to identity here, particularly in chapter 2, verse 18, um, you know, we see that God, you know, looks at man. He says, it is not good for the man to be alone, that I will make a helper suitable for him. He, he noticed that phrase there, it is not good. 
It's interesting because when you go back to chapter one, there's seven times where God says, and the Lord said, it was good. He looked in, at his creation and said, it is good. And even in, in verse 31, the Lord saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. And so it's kind of this striking difference and, and it's really intentional by you know the author to, to show this contrast that God looks at something and he sees now something is not good, something's not right, something needs to be adjusted, something needs to be fixed, right? And it's, it's it, very intentional. And what he sees that is not good is that it is not good for man to be alone. Now, I just want to speak to the guys here real quick because uh, we don't really do the alone thing very well, right? Uh, you know, we kind of can be a little messy. I mean, think about your life before your wife, right? Think about that. Um, it, let's just be upfront. Let's admit it. Let's, let's be unashamed about it. It was probably pretty sloppy. And it was probably full of uh, immaturity, maybe some selfishness there. I mean, that's it's okay. I know mine was. And the reality is, is, is many of us, we probably would be in agreement with that. Now, you know, single guys, your life right now, it's all about you. And that's okay. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, but the reality is, is that there's a maturing process that occurs in your life when you realize the words of God in Genesis 2.18 that, that points to and just says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. And, and there's a negative association of, of being alone, right? There, there's, there's God saw that it was not good. In a sense, what Genesis is telling us is that we are incomplete, that we are lacking when we are alone. And I'm not just talking about men, I'm talking about humanity, right? We are created by God. We have part of that image of God that is imprinted upon us is that God is a relational God, that we are created for relationship, right? And so when God looked and saw Adam alone, his creation imprinted with his fingerprints, his image on him, and it was not good because Adam was missing that companionship. He was missing a piece of him, an integral piece of him uh, that is part of the DNA of who God is, that God is a relational God. Now, what I'm saying here is I, I want to I be very clear that I'm not saying that, you know, that you're less than if you're not married or if you're widowed. That's not what we're talking about here. Uh, but God's design on our lives is to find fulfillment, to find companionship with others. In the New Testament, the church, it's referred to as the bride of Christ, right? And, and, and that's a piece of the identity that we all share as brothers and sisters in Christ, that, that we are created for a relationship. Our identity, it's wrapped up in Christ, and we are not complete apart from Jesus. But let's get back to this idea because we're talking about marriage, right? I want to just speak to those maybe that are, you know, right now they've been looking for a while for the right person, Maybe you're saying, you know what, that, that's me. You know, I, I've been looking, I've been waiting for God to answer that, that part of my heart, that, you know, that, that desire of my heart that I've been longing for. I, I want to I just encourage you with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 35. Uh, and uh, I, I think Paul has some very, very good things to say here about this. Uh, he says that, I say these for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. In, in a section where Paul is talking about, is it good for somebody to be married? Is it, is it bad for somebody to marry? Paul comes and, and kind of approaches it from a different angle. He says, you know, if, if, you're, if you're concerned about, you know, your, your husband or your wife, um, then, then there's a, there's, you're, you're, you're less able to minister to the Lord because you have a divided attention. And, and you know what? My encouragement to you is this, is that God knows the desire of your heart. God knows the desire of your heart. He knows that how he has created you, how he has designed you. He knows what's best for you. And he has a plan for your life. Now, maybe you're in this season and, and maybe it's a period of waiting and it's been a, a while of waiting, but I want to challenge you in that waiting that you're experiencing. Uh, maybe, maybe God wants to challenge you that in that moment, in that waiting that you're experiencing, no matter how long it is, God wants you to flourish. He wants, you, uh, he wants to use you. 
And so maybe a challenge to you is to, to that this time maybe is seeing it as a hurdle, as an obstacle, maybe see it as an opportunity where God is using you, uh, that you have more ability to be flexible in serving the Lord. And most importantly, I want you to know, and I want you to understand that your identity, it's grounded and founded in Jesus, not in a relationship, not in your marital situation. And so your identity, it's not in your partner. It's not in your future spouse. Your identity is in Jesus. And so that first crucial area we see here in Genesis chapter two, talking about identity. And the next crucial area that I think Genesis chapter two speaks to is it speaks to roles. It speaks to roles. Uh, What do I mean by that? Well, let's get into Genesis chapter two and let's look at 19 through 23. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whenever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, this is at last, or at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now in this passage, you know, we get this picture of God kind of bringing the animals and he's showing Adam, you know, these animals, he's kind of parading them in front of him and Adam's naming them. Now, some of the Hebrew, like uh, rabbinical teachings and traditions surrounding this passage kind of talk about how God was bringing these a- these animals to Adam and Adam was looking at them and, and, and these animals had their mate with them, their pair, but Adam was like kind of looking like, well, wait, I don't, I don't have a pair and all these animals were coming. And, and so that's an interesting thing to think about. But like Adam was looking for a helper suitable for him or a, a creature like him. Now, much of the account of the creation of, one, of woman is what's being stated is here is, is very unique from the other ancient civilizations uh, of, of, you know, their traditions, their ideas, and their views of man and woman. And so there's a lot of different things that are going on here, and, and there's a lot of stark contrast to the neighboring, you know, ideas and concepts about men and women and their roles and what does that look like. And so it, it's a very stark difference. Now, I want to focus here on this idea. It occurred here in chapter 2, verse 18, and it occurs again here in verse 20, when it says that there wasn't a helper fit for him. There's this word that occurs here that's a pretty unique word. The word, the Hebrew word is azer. It's azer. And it's very interesting because it, it, it's kind of a, it's caused some kind of uh, theological debate about really what it means. So, now, most translations that we read in the English translations translate it along the lines of a helper. You know, the ESV says a helper fit for man, or, you know, you might have uh, some of the other translations might, might say a suitable helper or suitable for man, or even a, a help meet. I don't even know really what that means, a help meet, but, uh, you know, that's, that's what some translations talk about. Now, more often than not, Whenever the word or the base, base word azer is used in the Old Testament, more often than not, it is speaking about God's work, his help for his people. Like if you think of the word Ebenezer, it's part of azer is in that word. And that means Ebenezer means stone of help, right? And so azer, help. Now, it's significant that we understand uh, God's intent for the role of men and women in the marriage relationship. I think it's very intentional because God lays out here, I, I, th- I firmly believe when we look at the surrounding culture, we look at marriage and the state of marriage, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of um, a hurt, a lot of baggage. And, and I think God wants to set us up for success in this. And so I think part of it is helping us to understand this idea of what Azer means. Now, uh, uh, the Bible commentary uh, uh, by Matthew Henry, uh, he kind of picks up on this a little bit about this uniqueness of this word Azer because Matthew Henry, he says it this way when commenting about the creation of woman. says, she was not made out of his head to rule over him, 
nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be beloved. See, the basic understanding of the word azer is equal value, different roles. Equal value, different roles. Now, ladies, a way to understand Azer, it can be pictured uh, as, as in the book Captivating by John and Stacy Eldridge. Uh, in that book, he, they use this picture of uh, capturing the, the word Azer and what it conveys and means. The picture they use, the illustration they use is a, a lifesaver, someone without whom you cannot get it done, Right. Uh, this idea of a lifesaver. Now, the imagery that they use there, I think it's unique, and I think it helps to helps women to see a very uh, you know positive end on the idea of the marriage relationship. Uh, I, I think it's such a high calling that God gives women uh, to be in that position of this idea of a lifesaver, this azer, this this helper, someone without whom you can't get it done, right? Someone without whom you just couldn't you just couldn't get it done. What a high calling it is, ladies, to be in that position when in the men in, uh, in the lives of the men around you. Um, someone without whom they could not get it done, and and I think that that's just so so telling, really, because I would agree wholeheartedly with this in concerns to my wife, you know, uh, she's just, I think such a huge blessing to our family. She's a huge blessing to, uh, you know, ministry. She's a huge blessing to my life. I mean, many of you without even knowing it, you've been probably blessed by something that she's either said or, or challenged me on in my sermon prep. And so the reality is, is, you know, I, I agree wholeheartedly, she, you know, someone without whom I couldn't get it done. I couldn't, you know, be the person that I am today. And so there's this idea of the azer being this lifesaver, someone without whom you can't get it done. Now, men, azer can also mean this, is someone who fills the gaps in our life, someone who fills the gaps, that God in his loving providence saw that you were deficient alone, that it was not good for the man to be alone, right? And so God in his providence saw that you had weaknesses and blind spots and gaps in your character and personality and thinking, and that, you know, God has designed your wife to fill up the gaps in your life right? Where your wife maybe is strong in one area, maybe you're weaker. Maybe you're stronger in another area. She's maybe weaker in that area. And that's okay. Men, your, your wife's differences, they're not a threat, but they're a blessing from God. And so what we see here is this idea, these areas. We're talking about roles, but then that kind of bleeds into the next crucial area that we see here that uh, we explore. And that one is the relationship, the marriage relationship. And I'm just going to wrap up here in Genesis uh, 2 with verses 24 and 25. So therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We read that a lot at weddings. Verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So right here in this passage, uh, we have this huge statement of, you've probably heard it said, the idea of leave and cleave, right? Leave and cleave. Maybe you've heard that, the idea of, you know, that, that you're a family unit unto yourselves, right? There's this idea of leaving and cleaving to one another, right? And that signifies a change in relationship from the families that each individual have, have, has come from. Now, again, it's the, the phrase one flesh, right? One flesh. It helps to really help, helps us to understand and contextualize the marriage relationship. The Hebrew word uh, used here to, to kind of talk about this idea of one flesh is echad. And, and, and really, it helps us to heighten our understanding, I think, of azer, that word that we talked about, that helper, that suitable helper, that lifesaver, or one who fills up the gaps. Because the idea that's being presented here, this one flesh, uh, you know, they, they left and they cleaved to one another. The idea presented here is this intimate and healthy, harmonious marriage relationship. Now, obviously, in the context of what we see nowadays, uh, you know, the divorce rate and everything else, we, we understand that there's something amiss here. There's something wrong. Something isn't looking like it was looking, or at least it was intended to look, back in Genesis chapter 2 when, when God, you know, created Adam and Eve and, and established this idea of a relationship between one man and one woman for life. And so something's amiss, something's wrong. 
And so is there, is there a way, maybe we ask, is there a way that we can get back to this original you know, intent of what marriage is? And does the New Testament help us in this? And I think it does. I think it does. Because if we take what we've learned here, and if we go to Ephesians chapter 5, when we talk about marriage, and Paul you know, begins this discourse in marriage, really, in verse 22, and he says, wives, Submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, I know when I I read those words, submit, that that can have some pretty negative connotations, right? Right? In our, t- in our society, in our day and age today, that idea of submission is, is very much seen in a very negative light. And I, I really like how Candace Cameron Bure, the author and actress, I like how she talks about the idea of submission because she recently came under scrutiny, really, for her definition, her understanding of her marriage relationship and her submitting to her husband. And, and she defines submission this way. I think it's really helpful says, it's meekness. It is not weakness. It's strength under control. It's bridled strength. And ultimately, in her understanding, that's really the basis of her understanding of submitting to her husband, it's really seeking a harmony in the leadership of the home. Now, again, it can still be, even with saying that, it's still kind of a hard pill, hard pill to swallow for some. And what, re, what it really, I think, boils down to is how we understand Genesis chapter 2, that idea of Azer. How do we understand that? And, and how does that affect the relationship that's being described of equal value, different roles? Of equal value and different roles. See, when we take a look at what we just saw in the meaning of the word Azer, and when we couple it here with Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 25, with what Paul is talking about in the marriage relationship and how that looks and works, I think it helps us to gain a better appreciation for what Paul's saying here. We can be really quick to jump on Paul's, Paul here and say, well, that's, that's uh, you know, chauvinistic. That's, uh, you know, uh, we, can, we can throw all kinds of different adjectives at him. But the reality is, is I think if we really start to dig into what Genesis 2 says here about Azer and couple that here in Ephesians 5, I think, it, I think it enriches what's going on here. Because, you know, what wife would not want to submit to her husband who is sacrificially loving her, who is treating his wife as the one who fills up the gaps in his life, valuing her input and her thoughts and leadership of the family, treating her as that person who he couldn't do without in, in leading the family and in, 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 in doing life together, right? What wife would not want to submit to her husband in that? And what husband would not want to give himself up for his wife? And who would want to squash uh, and and be domineering uh, of the woman that God has not only given to them to fill up the deficiencies that they have, but who also is a lifesaver, who's someone that you could not get it done with? And so the reality is, I think it really enriches us in, in our understanding of what Paul is really trying to convey here, that idea of intimate and harmonious and healthy marriage relationships. Now, you know, the thing of it is, is as I alluded to, that that's not what we see in our culture, right? We see a lot of uh, power playing and we see a lot of power struggles and a lot of disharmony in the marriage relationship. We see a lot of hurt and we see a lot of pain. People come into marriage relationships and they carry a lot of baggage into their marriage relationship. And one of those baggages that they carry into their marriage relationship is how they have seen it played out in their lives between their parents and their grandparents and so on and so forth. And so the reality is, is that uh, what an awesome thing for us to do as Christians to model this for our kids. That's one less baggage uh, item that they need to carry with them the rest of their lives in, 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 especially into their marriage relationships. Because God talks about the marriage relationship. He designed it as one that's intimate and healthy and harmonious. And so the big idea that I want us to walk away with today is that Genesis 2, it really gives us the why behind the what we believe of marriage. God's plan is one that conveys equal value and yet different roles. 
And it's the key to a healthy, harmonious relationship in marriage. And so we talked about the word azer, right? We talked about how that's the idea of a helper. And almost always in the Old Testament, it's connected to God and what he does for his people. And God is that same God for us when it comes to sin. You see, sin separates us from God and and we're unable to help ourselves. We're unable to save ourselves from the pit that our sin has created. We can't do it. We can't be our own helper, our own azer. And that's why Jesus came. He came to be our helper, our azer, the one who we can't do without in dealing with our sin. He paid the penalty for our sin. He died on the cross for our sin so that we didn't have to. And the Bible tells us that he's alive and that whoever calls on the name of the, of, of the Lord Jesus will be saved. You know, to accept Jesus as your azer, as your helper in regard to sin, it's as easy as A, B, C. A, we have to admit sin. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. It's not by uh, good works that we can somehow build our way or help ourselves back to God. It's not going to happen. It's only by Christ's shed blood on the cross. And then C, we have to call on Jesus and commit to following him. Maybe you're saying, you know what, Tyler, I've never done that, but I want to do that today. I want God to be my azer. I've been trying to do this on my own. I've been trying to build my way back to him. It's just not working. I can't, I, I can't do it. If that's you, I want to encourage you to pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me. Help me to live for you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for what we talked about today, this this idea of of marriage and and how we see the richness of what we see in Genesis chapter 2 and how it enhances. It's the, the why behind the what we believe of biblical marriage. Lord, thank you that you, you, you don't want us to fail in this, uh, that you want us to succeed and you, you give us the tools necessary. And so, Lord, I pray uh, for each and every person, uh, whether married or unmarried, Lord, would you help us to internalize this, help us to put this into practice in our lives. Help us, Lord, to, to recognize uh, the, the dignity, the, the equal value, yet different roles, and the, the healthy, harmonious relationship that you desire and that uh, you call us to be, have in marriage and that we can we can reclaim that. And we're just so thankful, Lord, for the Holy Spirit's work in each and every one of us and helping us to live in such a way as to please you and, and honor you in this holy relationship you created. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our live stream service. And I uh, just wanted to just, you know, give a, a quick update, uh, a special announcement. We are really excited for the opportunity to gather together in an in-person service here coming up on February 7th at 10 o'clock at the Monclova Community Center. And uh, we're really excited to to have this. We're going to have a service. And then after the service, 15 minutes after the service ends, uh, we're going to have a church meeting, uh, uh, kind of an annual meeting where, you know, our primary goal is to uh, give a financial uh, update for the church uh, from 2020 uh, to talk about our bylaws and affirm our bylaws and then uh, to affirm the, the budget for 2021. And and just really the biggest thing for us is we just want to be able to fellowship with one another. And so we're really excited about this opportunity. Now, uh, being that it's in, in a building in the state of Ohio, it mandates that, you know, when you're in that building, that masks are going to be required. So we're going to ask that you do wear a mask to the service. And, uh, and keep that on while you're in the building. And we're also asking that you could please RSVP in advance because due to COVID restrictions, uh, occupancy has been decreased uh, for their, ro- their, their largest room there. And so we, we just need to have a, a head count of who's going to be coming. We are going to be live streaming the service. And so uh, if you choose not to, to join us, that, that's okay. We're going to live stream. We'll be glad to have you join us virtually then as well. Uh, but if you're going to RSVP, you need to RSVP by by emailing office at lgechurch.email, emailing uh, how many are going to be in attendance and giving us your name. And uh, you can also call the church phone number, and that's 419-877-3120. And you can do the same there to RSVP. And we want to encourage you to do that as quick, as soon as possible, uh, so that we can start getting a head count, making sure that we're going to have enough space. 
Uh, but we're so excited to be able to join together. Again, that's February 7th, Sunday, February 7th uh, at 10 a.m. at the Monclova Community Center. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and have a blessed week.